And before I even begin, I want you to keep this in the back of your mind as we're going through this morning's gospel. There are only two miracles in all of the New Testament that are recorded in every single gospel. The resurrection and this morning's text. Now, when something like that occurs, it should make you say, hmm, why? Hopefully we'll get to that. Today is the Sunday before Advent. We have four weeks where we approach and we prepare for the coming of the King of Kings. We anticipate being participants in that future royal banquet that is symbolized in the Great Supper. Advent covers both the initial coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And if you actually look at the text, and I'll mention this more next week, a little bit more next week, if you actually look at all of the texts listed in the prayer book that deal with Advent, they almost invariably focus on his second coming whereas they leave Christmas and Epiphany to deal with the first coming. So here we have this great anticipation. We're anticipating a king. We're anticipating the arrival of our sovereign. We're anticipating, participating in that meal that we will share with him ultimately as a meal of fellowship. And that's where we begin with this morning's gospel. And please allow me to reread this one more time for you. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, A hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, Well, there's a lad here. He had five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down. In number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks... He distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would hold. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together, and filled them twelve baskets, with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And may God bless the reading of his word. What I want to talk about this morning is feeding heavenly food. And I want to also discuss with you Meals, Moses, manna, feeding heavenly food, and I want to talk to you a little bit about flesh. Jesus goes up into a mountain. He'd just been preaching. He's just been teaching. These crowds are gathered around him. And note, it says 5,000 men, and if you know anything about ancient Near Eastern culture, you know 
that during a census, a legal census, women were not considered to be a part of that census. So there is a redemptive historical purpose for that 5,000 number, and if you've heard me talk about biblical numerology, you'll understand the significance. That 5,000 is not a random number. Because the numbers 5 and 10 are significant. One deals with the number of man, the other deals with completeness. So I'm here, 5,000. And they were just fed by Jesus. They, just, they had just seen this miracle. They had just been given a heavenly meal. Now, in the Old Testament, meals cannot be overemphasized. They're overemphasized. Their significance is paramount in our understanding of the Jewish religion. Meals were a time of kinship. They were a time of friendship. They were never simply a time for nourishment. Meals are seen as a symbol of prosperity. Even the type of foods and the manner in which they were served carried with them a symbolic social significance. There was coded communication in eating. The more formal the meal, the more loaded the message. These messages would include factors such as honor, social rank in the family and in the community, belonging, and purity or holiness. Remember Luke 14, where there was the great meal, the invitees were to come, and Jesus said to the man in the assembly, he said, don't go and don't go and choose for yourselves the seat of honor. Choose the lowest seat. So that the host can say, no, no, brother, you come and you take the seat of honor. So the meal had a social significance. Even the tasks performed around the meal and the expectation of the completion of those tasks carried with it social status. And when God is included in these meals, it becomes a way for God's people to experience and enjoy God's presence. For the Jew, the meal became a place of distinction. It became a place of division and separation between themselves and outsiders, between their families and other ethnic communities. Gentiles and strangers were generally excluded from meals. Or they had to undergo a special ritual cleansing in order to participate. I, I hope I'm belaboring this and speaking slowly on these things so that you can see there is imagery going on and I'm alluding to the things that we all know to be a part of what we do as Christians. <coughs> Baptism, the Eucharist, which we'll get to in a minute. Not only was there ritual cleansing, but there would also be ritual holiness involved in the food itself. And every Jew understands this, and we even know it. It's become part of our vernacular. We generally refer to it as kosher. All of these elements would find their consummation in sacred meals intended to seal and dramatize the ratification of a covenant where God's presence is assumed. So this feeding of the 5,000 wasn't simply a miracle of changing a couple of loaves and a couple of fishes into a lunch. The realization, this realization becomes the understanding for the entire book of Revelation, where the meal presented there is a divine celebration of God's final victory and judgment, and it recalls Isaiah's vision in Isaiah 25. This eschatological meal announces the, the wideness of God's mercy and the universal scope of God's salvation to all nations, peoples, and races. Matthew 8, 
11, Luke 13, 29, and Isaiah 61, 3. It is not simply for the nation of Israel. And of course, it speaks of God's ultimate blessing to man. Matthew 26, 9, Mark 14, 25, Luke 22, 18, Revelation 3, 20, 19, 9, and 22, 17. And if you want those, you can get those from me later. So, we see that in just the introduction of this uh, gospel, these first 14 or 15 verses, where we see Jesus transforming a couple of pieces of nature into a miracle, it's far beyond the transformation of fish and bread. It's talking about something even greater. Think about what John says at the beginning of the gospel. He says, Jesus was teaching. A great multitude followed him. He went up to a mountain. The going up to a mountain would have been reminiscent for every Jew of what Moses had done. Moses, manna, and the bread from heaven. Or the second part of what we want to talk about this morning. Interesting that in the middle of that discourse, John simply says, and the Passover was nigh. And that was it. Doesn't say anything else. Doesn't, doesn't say a word. Just throws it out there. Think about that sentence in the Jewish mind. And the Passover was nigh. 400 years of slavery. The angel of death comes through Egyptian camp. God slaughters the firstborn. Only those with the sacrificial blood are spared. Then there's the, the exodus. They pass through the Red Sea on dry land. They're on the journey to the promised land. They've just experienced two of the most phenomenal miracles any human being could have ever seen. Death. Specific death. Designated death. This wasn't random butchering. This was the firstborn of every Egyptian. And unfortunately some Jews that didn't partake of the Passover. And then they watched nature completely changed. 60 days into the wilderness, what's the first thing the Jews start to do? I'm hungry. I want to eat. And then what do they do? They distort their own situation. They distort their own history. Remember what they said? They look at Moses and Aaron and Miriam and they sit there and they're complaining that they're hungry and they say, oh, why couldn't we go back to Egypt where we sat around those big pots of flesh and meat and we had so much to eat. Are they the same Jews that we just read about 400 years, that were in 400 years of captivity? I don't remember them having that type of Ruth's Chris meal ready for them. So they're complaining and they're moaning. And what does God say? Fine. You want to eat? I'll give you something to eat. And he rains down the food from heaven. And the first thing out of the Jew's mouth is, what is it? Because that's what manna means. What is it? And what does Moses tell him? You take enough for the day. You take enough for the day. You take enough for the day. And on the day before the Sabbath, you take enough for two days. In other words, gather, gather, gather. And what happens on the mount? They have enough food for the day, 
And the disciples gather and gather and gather. There would have been flags going off in everybody's head. Any cognizant Jew would have been going, wow, there's something going on here. The fact that Jesus ascended the mountain would have immediately reminded them of Moses. And that's proven by the fact that in verse 14 they said, it is that prophet of whom was foretold. Jesus then does what Moses did and feeds them heavenly food. And then all of a sudden, if we go through the next section of the gospel, there's a break. Anybody know what the next section of the gospel it is? Jesus walks on water. Okay, now wait a minute. Jesus goes up to the mountain. Jesus turns bread and fish into a, a, a feast. And then, then John says, Jesus walks on water. Now, I checked every commentary that I have. Nobody gives an explanation to this. They just refer to the text. I'm going to tell you what I think, why I think John put this here. You're not going to find it anywhere else, and if you do, please let me know. So don't hang your orthodoxy on this. This is my opinion. I'm telling you right now it's my opinion, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and I'll retract it. But I think given the flow of what John is saying, John is pointing out to the Jews and to his readers after Moses came down from the mountain, I mean, um, after he reminds them of Moses and the feeding and the Passover, well, what's the one thing that's not mentioned there? Well, the Exodus. So here, he says, Jesus was in the mountain, Jesus does the feeding, it's near the Passover, and now Jesus walks on water because I believe John is drawing their attention to the Exodus. There was the parting of the sea, and Jesus walks on the sea. There was God controlling nature, and Jesus controls nature. Because if you read the rest of that, that section, Jesus gets into the boat, and everything stops. So I don't think it was random. I think John was continuing the narrative the reminiscence of what the Jews were experiencing in the wilderness. And you can disagree with me, and I have no problem with that whatsoever. So, we see this meal that Jesus prepared. Uh, the, prepared. We see this heavenly food. We see the correlation with Moses and manna in the wilderness. And then, what happens? Those 5,000 are following Jesus. Or a lot of them. Thousands. Chasing them around the countryside. Oh, 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 do a miracle, do a miracle. Oh, 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 do a miracle, do a miracle. And Jesus tells them, this isn't, you're not here, you're not here because you believe me. You're here because of the, the bread and the loaves. You want to see another dog and pony show. And he says, I'll tell you what. Not only will I give you food, I will give you heavenly food. And if you eat of that heavenly food, you'll never die. Oh, man, we want that. Give me that. Fine. All you got to do is eat my flesh and drink my blood. Come, come again, Jesus. What, what was that? Do, do who? What? You heard me. All you've got to do, if you want to partake of this heavenly food, is to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And let's not, let, let's not kid ourselves. Jesus is talking about the Eucharist. There are three different interpretations of this passage, and they go on all extremes. One is the Roman extreme, the other is the real Presbyterian evangelical extreme. And then, of course, there's the correct one, the ones that we hold, the Anglicans. Um, and that is, 
He's talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. How do we know that? Because the crowd left. It wasn't, it wasn't exclusively talking about believing in him. They believed in prophets. That's not a problem. Jews believed in prophets for their entire history. Jews, Jews trusted prophets. They trusted Moses. They trusted Isaiah. Well, most of them trusted Isaiah. When Jesus said, you have got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, he was saying, you have got to partake of me. And let me tell you how significant this is. John uses the word flesh in his gospel 11 times. Just 11 times. Jesus cites it seven times in this chapter alone. And in verses 51 through 56, he uses it six times. Jesus is trying to make a point. The flesh, that very thing that drags us down to death, is that very thing that is going to impart in us eternal life. The flesh, that very thing that corrupts what comes out of our mouths, bitterness, and prejudice, and obscenities, and slander is going to be that very thing that saves us. Because the flesh that saves us is going to be a perfect flesh. Jesus is talking about the Eucharist. Unless you freak out and think that I've suddenly advocated cannibalism, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Because in verse 51, he makes it exactly clear what he's talking about. In verse 51, he's talking about his sacrifice. He says, because I am going to give my life. I am going to give my flesh. And I'm going to give my blood. And that is what you partake of. Here. Now you've heard me say this a thousand times. We don't drag Christ from the right hand of the Father and bring him down here. We are connected to Christ the head by the Holy Spirit, his body. And we as the church are in his body. The incarnation is real. It is not some Gnostic thought that runs through my mind and that's all I have to think about. The incarnation affects us right here. And when we are a part of the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and we come to this place we don't have to worry about dragging Christ down from the heavens because the Holy Spirit is never separate from Christ. And we, right here, partake of Jesus in all of his reality, in his personhood, in his flesh and blood. We're not chewing bones and tearing skin. We are partaking of the true person of Christ through his Holy Spirit. It's as if the Holy Spirit, at the point of our communion meal, pulls back the veil, that earthly barrier. And we, kneeling here, have our Savior reach across and give himself to us in grace. How many times do we encounter people that look at us and we say church is irrelevant to me? I, I don't I get nothing out of it. What are we offering them? I mean really Think about it. What do we offer them when we talk about church? 
Do we offer them friendship? That's a good thing. Do we offer fellowship? That's a good thing. Do we offer them forgiveness of their sins? Do we offer them the grace of Christ? You see, I can't imagine anything more relevant in any human being's life than to stand, kneel, or sit in God's house, to be a part of God's presence, to hear God's own words, to partake of God's grace, to feast on Christ as the forgiveness of our sins. To acknowledge the remedy for every problem we have at its core is right here in front of us. The sacrifice of the King of Kings. What could be more relevant than that? What could be more relevant than telling someone, I invite you, you, I invite you to come and be a part of a meal prepared for you by the God of the universe. Maybe I'm delusional. I don't know. And let's be honest. That's not easy. Because people don't want to be here. Even Jesus recognized it in this passage. Oh, that's a hard thing to understand, Jesus. I mean, eating your flesh and blood. Man, wow. I, mm, I can't i got to go milk a cow. I'll see you later. And what was Jesus' response to that? Unless a man is drawn by my father, he will not come to me. And I'm going to shock you this morning, beloved. The King James, and I love the King James, you know I love the King James. The King James blew it. The King James took the politically correct route in translating this verse and these verses. The Greek word in that passage is not draw. The Greek word in that passage, elkuo, means to drag, to pull, to haul, to physically lay hands on and take. Here's the same word. I want you to listen to this. Acts 16, 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone. This was Paul and Silas messing with the blacksmith in Ephesus. They caught Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace. They put their hands on them physically pulled them into the marketplace. Acts 21.30, And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul, and they dragged him out of the temple. They put their hands on him and physically dragged him. And forthwith the doors were shut. James 2.6, But you have despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you and drag you before the judgment seat. Jesus knew this was not an easy saying. Jesus knew full well people were not going to trust, it, trust anything that he said about eating flesh, about the sacrament. 
about partaking of him in heavenly righteousness. And he emphasized it by saying, the only way you're going to accept that is if my father searches you out as he searched out Adam and Eve and my father lays a hold of your heart and he changes your heart and he pulls you into his kingdom. As we're preparing for Advent, as we're looking, not only for the coming of the birth of the child, but we're looking for the return of the Lion of Judah. Let us also prepare our hearts for what John was pointing to at the beginning of this morning's gospel. That heavenly meal of which we are privileged to partake. Prepare our hearts because the God of the universe has by name called and invited each and every one of us to sit down with him and partake of his heavenly feast. We share in that weekly here because this is our great hope that at the coming of our King, we will share in the real heavenly supper for eternity.